evidence that God is real. And sometimes when we're laying in that hospital bed or we're the family or someone who loves someone who's laying in a hospital bed, we encounter God in ways that we're like, wow. And we become very thankful that he does help us. And, and just, again, emphasizing, hey guys, we need each other desperately. We need each other to be praying. So thank you, Janet, for sharing. I know that got you out of your comfort zone, but, but that was awesome. Appreciate it. We're going uh, to sing, and then I'm going to um, have a little bit of uh, a sermon from God's Word, and we're going to continue on in our service here. You can just stay seated. We're going to sing this prayerfully. Lord, I pray that you will revive us again. Lord, that you will uh, once again reveal yourselves in a very special way. Lord, as only you can do, we need you now more than ever before. And so, Father, I pray that you will make yourself real to us and that you will open your word and let it come alive in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In our study of Romans chapter 1, we have been brought to verse 18. And that's kind of one thing about preaching through a particular book of the Bible. Sometimes as a, as a pastor, it's just easier for you to pick a bunch of topics and, and you can pick stuff that is sort of warm and fuzzy and you know is going to make everybody feel good but this is a particularly difficult uh, section of scripture and one of the things that really makes it difficult is the climate in which we live because you see the the words that are contained in this scripture are by no means politically correct um, they are about as politically incorrect as what you can get in this day that we live. And, and, I, and I think that it would be a fair question to ask, will God ever bless America again? Because I think we really have experienced days in our history where, you know, God did bless America. Amen? I mean, America's been a blessed, blessed nation. But I think once we get into this scripture, uh, you're going to see, uh, are we living under God's blessing today? Or are we living under his wrath? We're going to read some scripture, and I'm going to do my best to, to work through it and, and help to bring the word of God alive in our lives. So read with me. You don't have to read out loud, but follow along in your copy of God's word. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 says this, For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But wait a minute, Pastor. Uh, I thought God was a God of love. What do you mean, God's wrath? Uh, what, what are you talking about, the wrath of God? 
And I want to tell you from, from the very beginning moment of this sermon that yes, God is a God of love. And the good news about all that's going to be talked about here in this particular passage of Scripture this morning is that He has sent His only begotten Son so that any of us who are willing to repent from this kind of a lifestyle, this kind of a mindset, all of us have the ability to have everlasting life present in a real place called heaven with God because of His great love for us. However, God is also a just God. And He is a fair God. And He is a good God. And, and if you look in this verse... Why is the wrath of God being revealed from heaven? It's against the ungodliness, things that would lead us away from God, things that would, would take us on a path other than what God's Word teaches, and the result of being ungodly is unrighteousness. In other words, it becomes a lifestyle of sin. And I'm, I'm here to tell you people, I love you, more than I can explain. But God is never going to bless over top of sin. He just won't. And when we find ourselves living in a sinful circumstance or a sinful lifestyle, we can never, ever expect God to bless that. And so when our politicians get up today in a nation where we've taken prayer out of the schools, we've taken the Ten Commandments down off of the wall, we have uh, made it so that the manger scene is no longer allowed to be displayed in the public venue, uh, when, when they get up and say, and may God bless America... That's stretching it. Now I think God will bless America again. But it's going to take revival. And, and revival, we, we need to stop looking for the next politician who's going to somehow lead us back on this patriotic journey back to our roots. I don't believe that's going to happen. See, I think it's going to start when, when Rebecca decides... I'm drawing a line in the sand and from this day forward I'm going to live according to God's ways. When Doris and Jared and, and Carrie and Rocky and, and, and Thomas and Don and Dennis and Ted and, and go right around the church when each and every one of us make that decision that, that we're going to say you know what Lord let revival start right here with the guy I look at in the mirror. Uh, let revival start in my heart. And then listen, do you remember the Philippian jailer? Remember when old Paul and Silas, uh, they were in jail and they began to sing and remember the jail doors all popped open and, and they escaped and the jailer, he was all worried about it because it was on his watch and he knew that he was going to get in trouble and, and he came to Paul and, and Paul basically shared the gospel and it says that the jailer believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but what? His whole family got saved. See, that's what we need. Well, we need some moms and dads to just get over themselves and just buy out to this whole idea of, of, of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then, and then it's going to trickle into the kids and it's going to trickle into the grandkids and it's going to trickle into the nieces and nephews. And if revival is going to sweep across America, it's going to be because a group of people allow it to start with you. And that's what I'm praying for. That's what I think God is up to here in the valley. Listen, there's stirrings happening. Something is going on. The Spirit of God is moving. And, and I want to be a part of it. I don't know about you, but I want to be part of it. And so I'm, I'm praying and I'm asking you to let revival start with you. I don't want to experience the wrath of God. I don't want to be a part of this type of a guy that lives an unrighteous life because of the ungodly uh, attitude of my mind or my heart. Listen, it says that they suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. In other words, the way that we live says we don't believe that this book is true. 
We suppress this truth and we say, well, you know, hey, that was for a, a day and a time way back when, but you know what? Come on. We, we live in a society. We're enlightened. And so this is no longer relevant. And so we, we live a lifestyle that suppresses that. It puts a lid on that and says, uh, that's not really what we believe anymore. We're going to go live like we feel like living. That's why the wrath of God is being poured out on these people. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident within them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are what? Without excuse. How many of you saw the stars last night? Did, were you able to go outside and, and look up? I mean, it was just one of those nights. The stars were amazing, weren't they? For those of you that saw them. Listen, here, what, what is this verse saying? This verse is saying when you go out on a night like last night and you look up and you see the magnificence of the stars, you have to know deep within yourself that there was a creator that caused that to be that magnificent. It just didn't somehow happen. That would be like me uh, going over to the job site, the construction site, and seeing the, the beautiful new log cabin that was being constructed. And, and the owner of the house brought me over because he was so proud of it. And he wanted to show me. And it was a magnificent you know, five-bedroom log cabin with all the kind of stuff. And it was just gorgeous. How stupid of it would it be of me to walk up to it and say, Oh, well, that just probably existed. What do you mean? Well, I'm sure that the trees just kind of got themselves cut down and, and over time it just sort of all kind of came together. Nobody really designed it and built it, did they? And that would be dumb, wouldn't it? That would be a stupid statement. And that's what he's saying here. Look, if you just look at the reality of creation, you have to know that there had to be an intelligent designer. There had to be a God who created it. It couldn't just exist. And so, so really, men are without excuse. If, if for no other reason than because God reveals himself through the creation. <laughs> Verse 21. Listen, even though they knew God, and, and here it is. Here's where I want you to begin to examine your life. Here's where the rubber meets the road in your life. I'm looking into your eyes right now and, and I'm, I'm kind of trying to fathom. And I'm not really seeing anybody that, that doesn't know the truth. I, I think all of you know about this stuff. I think that many of you actually have been raised from a little child on hearing about God in the Bible. Would that be a fair statement? And so you, you know who he is. You know about him. But, but where are you living? Because here comes the spiral downward. Do you want to know how to get yourself in a world of deep trouble? It says that they did not honor him as God. Listen, praise the Lord, Janet. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to stand up here and give God the credit. Give him the glory. Don, thank you. For last week, being willing to stand up here and say, and you know what? Without God, I wouldn't have been able to make it or something reasonable uh, that way. You see, that is living your life in such a way where you're giving God glory. You're giving Him the credit. You're acknowledging that, that everything that you have achieved in your life, every good thing that you have, has been because He has blessed you. And then the very next thing that they stop doing is, it says, or give Him thanks. 
You see, that's the two things in your life that you want to make sure that you're doing. How many of you have a busy schedule? Come on, be real with me. Renee, raise your hand. I know, your, your schedule's crazy. Come on. Your, your new parents back there, Ryan and Kim, I know your schedule. I've been there four times. Okay? Hey, our schedules are crazy, are they not? Hey, we can get into our busy styles of living and it's easy to forget these two... I know you're busy too, Ted, by the way. <laughs> you're not busy, Don. Hey, Don's not busy because he's retired, right? Anybody who's retired, you're not busy, right? My dad says, I don't know how I ever had time to work. <laughs> now that he's retired, he says, I don't, even, I, don't, I don't know how I had time to ever work. I got so much going on. But listen, it's so easy to get involved in living life. And, and it's not that maybe we intentionally got to a place where, oh, I think God stinks. Or, you know what, I've decided that I hate God. We really don't go there, do we? But we can easily get into a pattern of living where we really stop acknowledging and giving God the credit. And, and it's really super easy to stop being thankful to Him. I mean, I don't know about where you guys are living, but, but I know at our house, we still ask the blessing when we sit down at the table to eat. We still just pause. I mean, I'm hungry. But we pause and we say a prayer. And sometimes Rebecca prays. Sometimes Shelly prays. And sometimes I pray. But it's just our little way of, of just, you know what? Thank you, Lord, for this food that we're about to eat. Bless it to our bodies. And, 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 and if we're not careful, we can get into this pattern of life where we're going to be just like these people. And see, that's where it starts. When we stop acknowledging God and giving Him the glory and when we stop being thankful. Hey, by the way, I'm thankful that you were able to stand here with us this morning. Okay? I, I am. I'm thankful that, that Dawn survived. I'm thankful that Aunt Gladys survived her cancer and, and that, that Judy survived. And how many of you other uh, are cancer survivors? Raise your hand up. Bertha's a cancer survivor. Chuck's a cancer survivor. Hey, I'm thankful that you guys are still here with us. There'd be a big hole in my heart. And Phyllis is a cancer survivor. Okay? So, there, so you see what I'm saying? Listen, there's things about our lives. I'm thankful that God blessed me. Hey, I thought I was done having kids. Man, Aaron was eight years old. We had three kids and we were starting to talk about, you know, what are we going to do? The kids are starting to be grown up and, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were not going to suffer from empty nest and all this and that. And all of a sudden, she drops the bomb on me. I think I'm pregnant. Huh? I didn't think that could happen. Well, what are you talking about? You know, and, and it wasn't my plan. But guess what? Man, she's a blessing. I couldn't imagine life without her. She's my girl. My baby girl's turning 16 this summer. Oh, my word. Oh, Ryan. Oh, buddy. I'm telling you what, man. We need to talk. <laughs> oh, baby. We need to talk. But, but, but listen, I, I, am I thankful to God? Yes, I'm thankful to God. Do I tell him that? Yeah, I got a card this week in the mail. And it was from Teresa Etter. She's the administrator, or not administrator, but she works for the WRC over with the Edwood Heights Ministry and er, that whole program. And, and I had invited them to speak at our church association. And I, and I was really trying to get the church association to really see the tremendous partnership that we have with that organization because, you know, in today's world, they're still encouraging us and asking us to come in and do church and read scripture and, you know, uh, unlike most other organizations who are trying to push us out. And so I just invited them there and, and, and you know, and, and I get this thank you card in the mail. Thank you for being such an advocate and blah, blah, blah. Guess what? That meant something to me. You guys are so good to send me cards. I'm so bad to send you cards. Sorry. 
But once in a while, I'll get a card from somebody, thank you, or, or, or whatever it is. Listen, I think it still means something to God. I think it means something to God when we take time to thank Him. And it says that when they stopped doing those things in their life, when they became too busy or, or, or too involved with working or, or whatever their reason was, they stopped giving glory to God and honoring Him. And they stopped giving Him thanks. And listen to what happened to their thinking. But they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish hearts were darkened. And you see, it, it begins by those two simple things. I, I no longer give God the credit. I worked hard to accomplish it. And I no longer say thank you. But listen, if I didn't work 60 hours a week, I'd have never got it. God really didn't have anything to do with it. I earned it. I did it. I blah, blah, blah. No. God is God. To God be the glory. And you know what? Thank you for the, for the hospitals and the doctors and the nurses that prayed. And passive events an awesome place. But let's give credit where credit is due. Thank you, Lord. Okay? And, and so all of a sudden, you, you stop giving thanks to Him. You stop honoring Him. And pretty soon, your heart becomes darkened. And then all of a sudden, we, we live in a culture and a society where now we're surrounded by politicians and, and so-called leaders of our country who, uh, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And listen, we've all been guilty to a certain extent of having idols in our lives, things that were more important to us than God. Well, I can't be in church on Sunday mornings because fill in the blank. Or I, I could never teach a Sunday school class because or whatever it is and God loves us enough hear me God loves us enough that he's not going to reach down and treat you like a puppet he will not make you do anything he loves you enough to allow you to make these choices and make these decisions but listen when you do Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God. Listen, this is still the truth of God, people. This is still relevant. You can still base your life upon what it teaches in this book and, and it's a good way to live. But you see, they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And because they've walked away from God's word, because they've allowed their minds to be darkened, because they no longer give God the credit and give him thanks, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function of what is un for what is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit. Let's stop there. Do you want to know what a society looks like that is living under God's wrath and not God's blessing? Then the things talked about in this scripture are going to be what's present in the society. And in case you missed it, he was describing the homosexual behavior. Hey, it, it is one of the main things that's happening in our land today. We are being told that we are the ones who are intolerant. We are the ones that have the problem and that we should set God's word aside and we should embrace this now as a new lifestyle that's acceptable. How many of you have heard that? It's now a new acceptable form of life. You probably heard it in school. You've probably heard it in school. It, it, and, and, and we need to be sensitive 
to those who uh, are of this persuasion. You know why? Because listen, we've allowed our society to redefine it. Somehow we have fallen for the lie that there is a gene that causes them to not have a choice. That's not true. God would never condemn you for something that you didn't have a say over. That'd be like God saying, listen, Jared, you're a white man, so you're going to go to hell. That's not who God is. And, and so what we see is it's because they, they forgot to honor God. They stopped giving Him thanks and they went right down into the spiral. And if you allow yourself to go that, that far down, then you'll be in a society where, listen, living together is more popular than getting married today in America. That doesn't mean that I hate everybody who lives together. That means that, look, it's still sin. We, we have to not allow our society to redefine the social issues of our life. How have we uh, allowed for 55 million babies to be murdered in our country in the name of abortion? How have we done that? Because we've allowed society to redefine when life occurs. Listen, it's not a baby, it's fetal tissue. And so society, see, they go against what God's word teaches and, and, and they exchange it, it says, for a lie, for a myth. And somehow we, we justify it by the way that we live. Now we're suppressing the truth of God because of our unrighteous living. Hey, God's never going to bless over top of sin, people. Read all about it in the nation of Israel. In their history, there was sin in the camp. God didn't bless over top of sin. And he is not going to bless us over top of sin. I can't control what goes on in Washington, D.C., can you? That's why I said, if revival is going to come back to America, it's going to start right here. It's going to start as individual people decide, you know what, uh, I was trying to make it, uh, an argument for myself because I, I was living with somebody or, or I was trying to make an argument with myself because of this or because of that and, and, and we go justifying sin and all of a sudden we just need to wake up and say, you know what, boy, I know this is going to be different but from now on, I'm going to let this be my guide. From now on, uh, I, I, I'm going to let this be the filter of my life. That's when revival is going to happen. That's when God is going to begin to bless America again. Is when Americans get back to making his word their final authority. And, I, and I'm about done. I know we're tr tr trickling over here, but... I'm sorry. Verse 28 says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. That's where we're living, folks. Our leaders of our country have no longer seen fit to acknowledge God. It's no longer in God we trust. And here's what really scares me to death. Now it's beginning to show up in many of our churches. Many of our churches are beginning to compromise the truth. And, and they're beginning to say that, well, you know, this is really just a book of stories and we can't really literally take that it's true. It was written so long ago that it's really not relevant in today's world. And that's the garbage that's being put out from some of the churches right here in our own community. And I love people. But that's what's happening, folks. That's the reality of where we live. And so, you want to see fit to not acknowledge God anymore? Then here's what God will do. He loves you enough to give them over to a depraved mind. To do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and our gossips. See, that's what a society looks like that's 
living under the wrath of God because of the unholy, unrighteous choices that they've made. And I'm not trying to accuse anybody. I'm not. Please hear me. Uh, this is not a two by four hitting anybody in between the eyes. I'm only telling you this because I love you. I'm only telling you this because I know it is the truth. And when we're willing to get our lives in line with what God's word teaches, listen, life is going to go better for you. Will it all be perfect? No. Is that saying that there will never be any hard times? Not what I'm saying. But you'll be living under the protection and the blessing of God rather than feeling like God is against you. Now I don't have time to go into a whole lot more of it. But there's a couple scriptures that I'm going to read and then I'll be done. Number one, here's what I want you to know. There is no temptation that has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Hear this folks. Some of you may be dealing and struggling with temptation in your life right now. You may be involved in a besetting sin. I don't know. But listen to this. But with the temptation, God will always provide a way of escape. So that you will be able to endure it. You don't have to give in to these temptations. You have a choice. You can choose to turn to God and he will help, help you. And, and please don't be deceived. This is the last scripture and then, and then we'll close. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Listen, this is serious stuff. Not my words, the Bible. And they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, they're not going to heaven. Do not be deceived. Neither the fornicators. Fornication is what? Any kind of sex outside of marriage. You're not married. You're single. You're having sex. It's fornication. It's sin. Nor idolaters. Nor adulterers. There we got the married people covered. If you're having sex with somebody other than your marriage partner. That's adultery. That's also sin. Nor effeminate. Nor homosexuals. I didn't make it up. There it is. Black and white. It's listed. Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor while you think you're okay getting over on God because you're, 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 you're drinking to get drunk. He doesn't tolerate it. I'm not saying drink one beer and go to hell. I'm saying don't be caught in a drunken state. The word is clear. Stay away from strong drink. Okay? That's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But, but I'm telling you, God's not going to deal and put up with drunkards. Uh, again, I didn't make this stuff up. Nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here it is. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Listen, God welcomes anybody who is in any of those circumstances, he says, listen, my son died on the cross for you if you will repent of your sin and acknowledge and receive him as Lord of your life, you will be forgiven and I will make you a child of God. But listen, if you get belligerent and, and, and bullheaded and you say, look, that's the way it is for me and, and I don't like your preaching, Rocky Hammond, and, and you can just stop any time now and I'll be happy. I'm sorry. But you're not going to make it. If you choose to deliberately live a lifestyle of sin, the Bible says you're not going to make it. Now, all of us sin. I sin, you sin, we all sin. But we're not choosing to live a lifestyle of sin. Do you see the difference? I feel like I'm just getting started, but man, it's, it's, it's late. So I, I need to quit. You can read that for yourself. What it boils down to that our society is the last verse. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death. What is death according to the Bible? 
It is everlasting life outside of the presence of God. Spiritual death is you're going to wake up one day in a place called hell where you'll be forever separated from God. That they're worthy of death and they not only do the same but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Shelley's going to come up and lead us. People, we have a message. We need to love the people who we love enough to go and sit down with them and look into their eyes and have a talk. And we need to begin to lay open the word of God and say, look, I'm only saying this because I love you, but man, we've got some things we've got to discuss. I'm very concerned about the way that you're living. And maybe some of you here are concerned about the way you're living. Hey, if, if I was stepping on your toes and you're angry at me right now, I, I, I can handle that. And, and my advice to you would be, turn your anger into a prayer. And just say, Lord, am I angry at him because he's an idiot? Or am I angry at him because you're trying to tell me something? And just listen for God's voice. And whatever he tells you, you pray with him and you have a discussion with him and you allow him to fix whatever it is that he wants to fix in your life. Let's stand and sing. We're going to leave this place today glorifying the name of Jesus. So let's sing this song. <clears throat> simple altar call for you this morning when you walk out those doors glorify his name by the way that you live your life that's what it boils down to just just go be his people there are people in your life that desperately need to hear the truth so go live your life in such a way that will bring honor and glory to God. That's pretty simple. Father, I pray that you'll bless us. And Lord, give us the courage. Give us the strength to stand against the tide in this culture and be people who are willing to, in love, say, I'm sorry, but as far as my life is concerned, God's word is going to be my authority. Lord, that's a pretty stiff position for us to take these days. Make us brave. Give us courage. And use us to point people to your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now God go with you.